Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Arunachala Ramanaya. Um, today I'm going to be talking about um, uh, verse 10 of Uludunapdu Anabandam. This is an original verse of Bhagavan. He composed it first in Sanskrit and then almost immediately in Tamil also. So I'll, I will um, talk about the Tamil version first and the, then the Sanskrit version. Um, <clears throat> the, in this verse, Bhagavan is explaining a well-known um, aphorism, you can say, that summarizes Vedanta. That is deham, naham, koham, soham. Deham, the body, naham, is not I. Koham, who am I? Soham, he is I. Um, this summarizes the, the essence of Vedanta. And he is I, in he is I, he means uh, God or Brahman. Um, so the the reason for this, or, or the, yeah, this is Bhagavan is expanding this in this verse and clarifying it. <clears throat> the first statement is um, "deham naham," the body is not I. Um, in this context, we have to remember that Bhagavan has clarified that when he talks about the body, or when the body is talked about in Vedanta. It includes all the five sheaths. As he says in verse um, 5 of Uludunapadu, Uru Pancha Koza Uru, the body is a form of five sheaths. Adanal Uru Ennum Solil Aindum Adongum. Therefore, in the term body, all five are included. <clears throat> so when he in this verse, when he talks, when he uses the word deham, which is a Sanskrit verse word that means body. It means the same as Udal in Tamil. Um, he's referring to not just the physical body, he's referring to all the five sheaths. Um, <clears throat> so what he says in this verse is, um, in the first sentence he says, Deham uh, Gadam Nikha um, uh, Jadam. That means the body is Jada, like a pot. Um, jada means it's not aware, it is it's devoid of uh, awareness or sentience. So the body is insentient like a pot. Um, and then in the next sentence, he says, Iduku aham enum tihuru iladal na aham jadalam il tuinil uh, dinum urum namadu il al. Uh, what that means is he gives two. That that is the, he's explaining why the body is not I. So the first reason body is not I, he says in the first sentence, the body is jada like a pot, whereas I is obviously awareness. Um, and then in the second sentence, he gives two more reasons. He says. Um, Iduku aham enum tihuvu illadal, since the shining called I does not exist for it. The shining called I means the awareness, the self shining awareness, I or I am. So uh, <clears throat> awareness shines by its own light. The body doesn't shine. So the, the, the shining called I, it implies, what he means by shining is awareness. The awareness called I does not exist for it. In other words, it, it is uh, the, the self-shining awareness I uh, does not exist for it. In other words, it, since it is not aware of itself as I, that's one reason. And another reason he gives is, since our nature exists in daily in sleep, in which the body does not exist. Our nature here means our real nature, ourself as we actually are. In other words, our, our fundamental awareness, I am, which is our very being, in other words, such um, uh, it. That exists and shines daily. Well, he just says exists, but whenever he Bhagavan talks about existence, existence and shiny are one and the same. 
Exist, existing is sat, shining is chit, and chit and, and sat are one and the same. That, uh, that is existence and awareness, being and awareness. Um, so since our nature exists daily in sleep, in which the body does not exist, it is not I. So very, he, he's given us here three reasons why the body is not I. Firstly, it is insentient like a pot, um, whereas I is obviously sentient. I is awareness. Um, I is the name by which awareness knows itself. Uh, so I always refers to that which is aware, because only that which is aware can... Uh, I is the self-referential pronoun, so only that which is aware can refer to itself. Um, uh, <clears throat> Um, it, so first reason, it's insentient. Second reason, that awareness I does not exist for it. That amounts to pretty much the same thing. That is, the body is, a, is insentient because the, uh, shine, because the awareness I does not exist for it. In other words, it's devoid of the awareness I, therefore it's insentient. So those two, first two reasons are very closely related. Most important reason of all is is the fact that we exist and uh, and uh, shine in sleep. In other words, we're aware of our, our own existence in sleep as I am, but the body does not exist in sleep. When he says the body does not exist in sleep, he means all the five sheaths do not exist in sleep. So not only the physical body ceases to exist in sleep, the prana also ceases to exist. The, um, the, the manas, the manamaya kosha, um, the, in other words, all the grosser functions of the mind cease to exist. The intellect ceases to exist. And the uh, anandamaya kosha, or karana sarira, also ceases to exist. This is... This is... Um, Bhagavan is... is giving us a more refined understanding about the nature of sleep than is generally given in, um, in Advaitic texts. In Advaitic texts, because people want to know, if ego doesn't exist in sleep, how does it come back into existence again in waking? Um, the explanation that is usually given in most Advaitic texts is that though the ego ceases to exist in sleep, the vasanas remain the vasanas are the seeds that uh, give rise to all phenomena. The vasanas remain um, in, in the form of the karana sarira, in seed form, uh, uh, and they, um, they, uh, uh, it, it's the vasanas that cause these go to arise. This is a, an explanation which is given in many texts. But this obviously isn't a very satisfactory explanation, because whose vasanas are they? Their egos vasanas. So, in the absence of ego, how can vasanas exist? So, if ego doesn't exist, as Bhagavan says in verse 26 of Uludnapu, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. Since ego doesn't exist in sleep, that means everything doesn't exist in sleep. Everything means all phenomena. What exists and shines in sleep is only our own nature, our, what we actually are. What he means by nature is uh, what we actually are. Um, so he's referring to Swarupa, Atma Swarupa, as uh, Namadu Eel. Eel is a Tamil word that means nature. Um, so uh, what we actually are alone is what remains existing and shiny in sleep. The body and all the five sheaths cease to exist in sleep. And consequently, the world also ceases to exist in sleep. Um, anyone who's read Nana um, may say at this point, but Bhagavan says in the eighth paragraph of Nana, but the prana remains in sleep to protect the body. Um, in, in, um, in later versions of Nana, uh, such an explanation is included, but that wasn't in the original text of Nana. When Bhagavan, uh, uh, I mean, it wasn't part of the questions and answers recorded by Shiva Kashyapalai, 
and it wasn't in the essay version of Nana, but Bhagavan wrote in the uh, mid-1920s. It was only added about 10 years later, presumably because someone would have asked Bhagavan, um, but how can you, because Bhagavan says there, but when the, when um, the prana ceases, the mind ceases, and when the mind ceases, the prana ceases, someone would have asked Bhagavan, but in sleep there's no mind, but how come the prana remains in sleep? So Bhagavan, but, that is often Bhagavan would make it clear that there's no no prana at all. There's nothing in sleep. There's no body or world or anything. But some people are not willing to accept that, or it's very difficult for them to grasp that. So sometimes Bhagavan gave more diluted explanations. So perhaps to that person who asked that question, Bhagavan would have given a more diluted explanation, saying the, the prana remains in sleep, in order to protect the body, um, and so but people don't think the body is dead. Bhagavan may, may have said that to someone, but that is not his deeper teaching. His deeper teaching is there's no body at all. No body means no um, no prana, no manas, not, um, all the five sheaths do not exist in sleep. Why? Because ego doesn't exist in sleep. As he says in... Um, in the first sentence of Nana, when, when he wrote it as an essay, he added a, one extra paragraph at the beginning, which wasn't part of the original questions and answers. That In that first paragraph, in the first sentence of that first paragraph, he says, since, um, since happiness, which is our own nature, which exists uh, in, in sleep, which is devoid of, in which the mind doesn't exist, when he said the mind doesn't exist there, what he means by mind in that context is ego. And again, in verse 21 of um, Upadesha Undia, he, uh, when he's explaining what is the real meaning of the term I, he says, um, since we do not cease to exist in sleep, which is devoid of I? When he said devoid of I there, Obviously, he means devoid of ego because he says we uh, are, are uh, he's, how he expresses it there is because of the absence of our non existence. In other words, because we do not cease to exist in sleep, even though I ceases to exist, there I means ego. Um, so the real import of the word I is not ego, but that which is eternal, that which is ever existing and shining. So, According to Bhagavan, in sleep there is no ego, therefore there is no body, no world, there is nothing other than our own nature. Um, so, as I say, this is a departure from the usual explanation that is given in Advaita. The reason this explanation is given in Advaita is that Advaita in its purest form, as expressed in the um, core teachings of Bhagavan, it's very, it, it, most people will not be willing to accept it. So to make it palatable to people who are not willing to think so deeply and to accept um, that everything seems to exist only in the view of ego. Therefore, in the absence of ego, nothing else exists. For people who are not willing to accept that, um, the, 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 Diluted explanations often need to be given, and that's why Advaita is full of so many diluted explanations. So if we want to understand Advaita in its very purest form, uh, Bhagavan's, uh, Bhagavan's works like Nana, Uludu Napadu, Padeshundia, Aranatya Stuti Panchakam, these ex in these texts, Bhagavan expresses Advaita in its very purest form, without any compromise. But sometimes, just like the, the older texts, in the older texts, so many diluted explanations are given. Bhagavan also sometimes gave diluted explanations because, as Bhagavan said, the teaching needs to be according to the taught. But what he's what he taught in in Nana and Uludu Napadu, Lupadesh Undia and Amma and such texts, these are for these are for mature 
aspirants like Shiva Prakash and Pillai, Murugana and uh, so on. So if you want Advaita in its very purest form, Bhagavan's texts are the place to find it expressed. Um, so, as I say, he in this first um, two lines of this verse, he gives three reasons why the body is not I. Firstly, it's insentient like a pot. Secondly, it's devoid of any awareness called I. In other words, it's not aware of itself as I, uh, because it's insentient, obviously. Um, and um, thirdly, the body, though we do not cease to exist in sleep, the body does not exist there. Therefore, the body cannot be I. Oh, one, one, um, one other point to um, bear in mind in this context. One of the arguments given in the Dvaitic text, why, um, why we are not the body, uh, or any, is that um, in sleep, uh, what remains in sleep is only I. Nothing else remains in sleep. Therefore, what uh, what we are cannot be any of the things that appear in waking and dream but disappear in sleep. Since everything disappears in sleep, we cannot be anything other than the pure I. I mean, the, the, the awareness that remains shining in sleep, that alone is what we actually are. And that is just the awareness I am. This explanation is given in Advaitic texts. But at the same time, they say that the Karana Sarira, the Ananda Maya Kosha, remains in sleep. That's uh, the, abund uh, the totality of all the Vasanas remains in sleep. But if such is the case, then what reason do we have to suppose that this body is not I? I at least they, they, these um, vasanas, we can say, the Anandamaya Koja, the Karana Sarira, at least that is I, because that exists in all three states. So unless we are willing to accept that in sleep none of the five sheaths exist, um, what exists in sleep is only I, if, if we're not willing to accept that, then we've got no reason to suppose that we that the karana sarira is not what we actually are, because the karana sarira certainly exists in waking and dream, because the whole of waking and dream is a play of our vasanas, and the, uh, the, the karana sarira consists of vasanas. So karana sarira definitely exists in waking and dream. If it also exists in sleep, then what reason do we have to suppose that we're anything other than this Karana Sarira? So Bhagavan makes it very clear, the body does not exist in sleep. Uh, uh, he's, in this Tamil verse, he says, Jadalam il tuinil, in sleep in which the body does not exist. Um, and the body here includes all the five sheaths, as he made clear in verse 5 of Uludunapadu. So we, we need to think very carefully about these verses to understand re, uh, the full impact of what Bhagavan is saying and the full significance of what he's saying. Why is this important? Because this is particularly important when we are trying to investigate what we are, what we actually are. Because if we suppose that we are anything that... Uh, doesn't exist in sleep, we will be we will be investigating that rather than what we actually are. What exists in sleep is only ourself. So every day we experience a state in which we exist devoid of everything else. So that which is shiny in sleep is what is shiny even now as I. So this is the I we have to investigate. So understanding this clearly is of great Practical significance when it comes, I mean, Bhagavan's teachings are all about practice. Merely understanding the philosophy is not sufficient. The, the Advaita as a philosophy is useful only to the extent to, to which it turns our attention back to ourself. Because only by turning our attention back to ourself can we discover for ourselves, experience for ourselves. The truth of Advaita, but there is one only without a second, Ekameva Advaitiam. Um, so having having 
concluded that the body is not I, what should we then do? We then need to investigate who am I. So that is what Bhagavan expresses in the, in the second two lines. He talks about the investigation, who am I, and what will result from this investigation. So what, he's, what he says in the... Um, what he says in the um, in the, the, the last two uh, two lines is um, uh, wait a second uh, uh, ko ahang ko ahang ko ahankara uh, no sorry ko hankara, um, um Ebon Ulan Unandu Ulla Ul Gu uh Ulla Guhe Ulle uh Saha Aham um is or Soham um uh Purana Arunagiri Shiva Bibu Swayam Olivan. Um Koham is a is a compound of two words, Haha, which means who and aham, which means I. But Bhagavan doesn't just say here uh, koham, he says kohan ahankaram. That is, who is this e koha ahankaran? Ahankaran is a personal form of ahankaram. Ahankaram means ego. Uh, ahankaran means the one who is ego. So who is this one who is ego? Is, is what he's asking us to investigate here. Who is this one who is ego? Evan Ullam, where is he? Where is they? That, that is this, this, um, this entity called ego has risen and is experiencing all this. We seem to be ego so long as we're looking outwards at other things. But if we look back at ourselves to find what is this ego and uh, where is he, we don't find any such thing. Um, so, uh, 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 kaha ahankaram means um, who is this one who is ego? Uh, Evanulan, where is he? Unandu means knowing or uh, yeah, no, knowing or being aware. Uh, Ulla, those who exist. Uh, Ulla guhe, the cave of the heart. Ulle, within the cave of the heart. So this first, um, this third line of the verse means, um, within the heart cave of those who are knowing who is the one who is ego. Those who are implies those who, who just are as they actually are. In other words, those who are being as they are, knowing or being aware of, uh, of themselves as such by investigating who is the one who is ego and where is he? So he's within the cave of the heart of uh, those Tibra Bichar, those Tibra um, Adhikaris who investigate so keenly to who, who, what this ego actually is. Um, uh, sorry, I'll go back to the verse. Um, Sa, sa, soham. Soham is, uh, again, like koham. Soham is a compound of two words. Saha means he. Aham means I. So, uh, saha, aham means he is I. Uh, purana, arunagiri shiva bibu, swayam olivan. What that means is, um, uh, bibu means... Um, Vibhu means what is um, uh, um, what is extending everywhere, what is filling, what is pervading, what is omnipresent, eternal, supreme, powerful, omnipotent, the ruler, sovereign, and therefore it implies God or Lord. Uh, so the, the, we can take it, we can translate Vibhu as the omnipresent Lord. The omnipresent Lord, who is that omnipresent Lord? Arunagiri Shiva. Arunagiri is another name of Arunachala. Aruna is the name of Arunachala, and Giri means hill. So Arunagiri Shiva Vibhu, um, uh, um, the, the omnipresent Lord, Arunachala Shiva. Um, 
so our natural Shiva, though it appears to our outward looking mind in the form of a hill, it is actually that which is omnipresent. There's not a, there's not a, a there's no place in, in time or space where Arunagiri Shiva is not existing and shining because he is I. Um, uh, uh, so I, the omnipresent Lord, Arunagiri Shiva, uh, Swayam Olivan, he will shine spontaneously. Swayam, that, that in Tamil Swayam, uh, is a, a Tamil form of the Sanskrit word Swayam, which means uh, oneself, itself. Uh, it also implies uh, by itself, um, uh, of its own accord or spontaneously. So here it's used in the sense of spontaneously. And then the other word he uses here is, uh, is Purana. Purana here is, is a Tamil form of the Sanskrit word Spurana. Spurana means uh, the clear shining um, uh, uh, or the clarity. So he, the, the omnipresent Lord, Arunagiri Shiva, will shine spontaneously as for clarity he is I. As is not there, but we have to understand it. The, literally, the, this last line means um, uh, the omnipresent Lord, Arunagiri Shiva, will spine, shine spontaneously the clarity he is I. What that implies is... Um, uh, the omnipresent Lord Arunagiri Shiva will shine spontaneously as the Sporana, or clarity, or clear awareness, he is I. So here, an, another point to note here, Bhagavan doesn't take, some people take he is I, Soham, to be a method, uh, to be a practice. They meditate, he is I. But Bhagavan makes it clear here, the practice is koham. That's what we need to investigate. We need to investigate who am I. If we investigate who am I, then it will shine clearly that then the, the, the one uh, infinite reality, Arunagiri Shiva, will shine uh, spontaneously as he is I. That is, it will become clear to us that... Um, but there's no I other than Arunagiri Shiva. He alone is I. Um, so but, but, but I'll just read the whole verse, the, the meaning of the whole verse again. It is, the body is insentient like a pot. Since the shining called I does not exist for it, since our nature exists daily in sleep, in which the body does not exist, it is not I. Those two senses implied there, and is implied there, but it's not actually there. So, uh, since the shining called eye does not exist for it, and since our nature exists daily in sleep, in which the body does not exist, it is not I. Within the heart cave of those who are, uh, knowing the one who is ego, no, knowing who is the one who is ego, where is he? The omnipresent Lord, Arunagiri Shiva, will shine spontaneously, the clarity he is I. That's a literal meaning of the verse. If we slightly, um, a slightly more explanatory, um, uh, an explanatory paraphrase of the verse would be, the body is jada, insentient or non-aware, like a pot. Since the shining or brightness called I, namely the self-shining awareness I am, does not exist for it, that is, since it is not aware of itself as I, and since our real nature, that is our fundamental awareness I am, which is our very being, exists and shines daily in dreamless sleep, in which the body does not exist, it, the body, is not I. Within the heart cave of those who just are, as they actually are, knowing or being aware of themselves as such by investigating who is the one who is ego and where is he, the, the, the omnipresent Lord, Arunagiri Shiva, will shine spontaneously as the sparana, the clarity or clear awareness, he is I. So this is the meaning of the Tamil verse. As I say, the, the Bhagavan originally composed this verse in Sanskrit on the 
20th of September, 1927. That's a few months after he had composed Upadesha Undia and uh, Anma Vide. I think he, uh, Upadesha Undia and Anma Vide, he composed in about April of 1927. In September of 1927, he composed this first. And then a year, uh, uh, nearly a year later, in July and August of 1928, he composed Uludunapdu. Um, so, as I say, he first composed this verse in Sanskrit, and then the same day or very soon after, he uh, he uh, uh, composed it in Tamil also. So the the original Sanskrit verse is, um, I'm not very good at reading Sanskrit, but I'll try my best. Deham Rinmaya Bajat Atmakam Um my dyslexia also doesn't help. Um uh Aham Buddhi Na Tastato Tas Na Tasyastato uh Naham Tatata Baba Supti Samaye Siddhatma Sat Babataha Sat Babaha Koham Baba uh Yuta Kuto uh Varadiya Drishta Drishtva Atmanishtatmanam Manam um, Soham Sporti Taya Arunachala Shiva Pono uh, Bibati Swayam. It means almost it, it, it's but that is the, the two verses, the Sanskrit version and the Tamil version, are very, very close in meaning. Um, the first sentence of the um, of the, the Sanskrit verses, Deham Rinmaya uh, Bhat Jada, Jada Atmakam. Um, Deham means body. Mrinmaya means um, uh, Mridmaya. Mrid means uh, um, uh, body. So Mrinmaya means compose. No, sorry, Mrid means clay. So um, Mridmaya, Mridmaya means composed of clay. So it implies what is composed of clay. So uh, the body, what is composed of clay, but means like, jada means um, insentient or non-aware, atmakam uh, means of the nature of what is insentient. So the body is of the nature of insentience, like anything composed of clay. Um, anything composed of clay is refer obviously ref implying a pot or anything else that's composed of clay. The body is insentient like that. And then he goes on to say, Aham buddhi hi na tasya uh, asti. That means um, uh, there is no I concept belonging to it. No aham buddhi, no I concept belonging to it. Um, uh, ataha na aham, consequently not I. Therefore, it is in that, that implied. Therefore, it is not I. And then he gives another reason. Uh, tad, tad, the first tad means also. The second tad means uh, it, referring to the body. Ababa supti same. Also, because of the. Uh, be, be, so, okay, I'll read the whole thing. Um, uh, uh, the first tat, tad, as I say, uh, means um, or tat means uh, also. The second one means uh, it, referring to the body. Abhava supti same means in the time of sleep when it doesn't exist. Siddhatma satbhava to her. Um, so what that means is also because of the established, Siddha here means the established, uh, continuity. Here, Baba means, Baba means existence, continuity, endurance. So, but in this context, it means we can take it as continuity because Sat means existence. So also because of the established continuity of the existence of oneself. That is atma sat baba to her mean the the, um, the, uh, the continuity of the existence of oneself. Supti samayi means during sleep or the time of sleep. 
uh, Pat, Pat Ababa, in which it is non-existent. Um, so, uh, because uh, he, he, as in Tamil, he gives three reasons here why the body is not I. Firstly, it's uh, it's um, it's it's of the nature of jada or in sentience and non-awareness, like anything composed of clay. Secondly, there's no ahambuddhi, that means I concept or I awareness for it. It's, it's devoid of the awareness I. Um, tasya means uh, of it, that, that the genitive uh, form of, um, of, uh, of, of tat. Um, but um, uh, it, it implies belonging to it. There's no I concept belonging to it. It's devoid of the awareness I, in other words. Ataha Naham, consequently, it's not I. I and mean, then he gives another reason. The third reason is because of the established continuity of the existence of oneself during sleep, in which it is non existent. So, here, one very important wo word is the word Abhava. Abhava means non existent. It ceases, and the body does not exist in sleep. However, in many of the printed versions of this verse, instead of the word of Baba, the word of Peter occurs here. Tatada Peter Supti Samei. In most of the printed versions of this verse, the word of Peter occurs here instead of a Baba. The reason for that is when Kavya Ganta Ganapati Sastri saw this verse, he changed the word of Baba to a Peter. A peta means, um, a peta can also mean non-existent, but, but the exact meaning of a peta is, um, uh, it means it gone, departed, disappeared, or free from. So it's not as forceful as a barber. So by by changing a barber to a peta, uh, Kavya Ganta watered down the meaning and the impact of what Bhagavan intended by the word Ababa. Just like in Tamil, he used the word ill. Ill is, in Tamil, there are two, two words that mean ill. Sorry, that mean, but, but there are two negative uh, roots. One is ill, which denies existence, which uh, negates existence. And the other is al, which denates um Denates at, de, um, negates attributes. So if you want to say um, uh, something, um, if you want to say about someone, he's not here, you, you would use the word al, because al, you're denying the attribute of him being present in this place. Um, but if you want to say, he doesn't exist. He's gone. He's dead. You would say ill. So um, ill means non-existent. Al means that you're just denying an attribute of some of, of someone. Um, uh, if you want to say someone, for example, is not uh, is not in good health, you would use al. If you want to say something doesn't exist, you use ill. So here, but in the Tamil verse, Bhagavan used the word ill. Um, and equally forceful in Sanskrit, he used the word ababa, whereas a peta could imply the same thing, but it's a bit more, it's a bit diluted. It simply says it's departed, it's disappeared, um, not that it's actually non-existent. So um, that is probably because, um, well, we don't know, but presumably the reason, I mean, there's no, there's nothing, uh, Poetically wrong with the barber. A painter doesn't change the, the poetic meter or anything in, in any way whatsoever. So the fact that Kavyaganta changed the word presumably means he didn't like the word of Baba there. So presumably that means he it was difficult for him to accept that the body doesn't exist in sleep. Just like many people. I mean, many people find it very difficult to accept. No, no, I wasn't aware of the body, but um Anyone who saw me while I was asleep, they would have seen my body. When I wake up, they will tell me, yes, you were sleeping very soundly. So they must have seen my body. So my body must have existed in sleep. That's how most of us think. Because so long as we are looking outwards and taking 
all this appearance for reality, it's very hard for us to accept what Bhagavan teaches us, namely that nothing exists ex independent of our perception of it. Just like in a dream, whatever we uh, see or experience in a dream doesn't exist independent of our perception of it. That is, we see a world full of people, we have discussions, we we desire this or that. And I mean, we go through so many experiences in dream, but whatever we experience in dream doesn't exist at all independent of our perception of it. Likewise, according to Bhagavan, this present waking state is nothing but a dream. So whatever we experience here has no existence independent of our perception of it. So since the body, the mind, body, and world do not exist in sleep, therefore, sorry, since since we are not a, they, since we're not aware of them in sleep, therefore they do not exist in sleep. That is Bhagavan's conclusion, and uh, Bhagavan is not only Bhagavan is not uh, just saying that as a philosopher. Bhag this is Bhagavan's actual experience. He, Bhagavan was this is what Bhagavan saw, saw clearly to be the case. And he taught us accordingly. <clears throat> the ultimate truth is, as Bhagavan made clear, and is also made clear in the Upanishads and by Godapada and others, all these things that seem to exist do not actually exist at all. The ultimate truth is ajata. Nothing has ever come into existence. Nothing has ever even seemed to come into existence. Why is that? Because everything seems to exist in the view of ego. As Bhagavan uh, made clear to us, if we investigate this ego, we will find there's no such thing at all. Since there's no ego, therefore whatever is experienced by ego is equally non-existent. So the ultimate truth is ajata. But this is very difficult for for many people to accept. So Kavyaganta is one of those people who found it very difficult to accept the Advaita in the pure form that Bhagavan taught it. And so he would have changed this word Ababa to a Pater um, to try and soften the impact of it. Um, but it, obviously that's not very helpful for us because we want to know what Bhagavan is actually saying. Bhagavan clearly said Ababa. Um, so it's important to bear this in mind because if you read other trans, uh, other um, uh, versions of this verse, many of them have the word of Peter there. And if you read translations, if the word of Peter has been um, translated, in various ways people translate it, but it's not as impactful as a barber, which clearly means the body does not exist at all in sleep. Um so that is the first two lines of the verse. And then he goes on to say, Kaha aham bhava yutta kotas varadiya drishtatma nishta atmanam. That means, uh, atmanam, um, yeah. Uh, what that means is, um, Atmana means to selves, to, to, in other words, to those fixed uh, Atmanishta, uh, who fixed as themselves, those who are firmly fixed as themselves, in other words, those who are firmly fixed as they actually are. Uh, drishtva means having seen, uh, Varadiya, by a discerning intellect, um, Kaha Aham Baba um, uh, Yutta. Uh, Aham Baba means ego. The, 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 um, how to put it? Aham Baba means, um, uh, wait a second. Uh, yeah, Baba in this, the, 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 it, Baba means existence, being, or can also mean a condition or state. So Aham Baba is the I condition. In other words, it implies ego. Yutaha means one who is united with or one who is yoked with. So it means the, the ahambhava yutaha uh, means the same as ahankaran in Tamil, the one who is ego. Um, so, uh, uh, 
to souls fixed of themselves, having seen by a discerning intellect who is the one yoked with the eye condition, uh, from where? Uh, um, uh, kutas means from where. It in, in this context, it implies from where from where does his ego arise? It is what it implies, but it, it's I won't simply says from where. Um, so uh, for for them or to them, for, oh yes, for for two souls we can also take as four souls for for those who are uh, um, that is up my name. Wait a second, let me see. I've got it note down noted down here. Um, Atmanam um, of souls belonging to souls is the, the genitive um, sixth case uh, plural of Atman, but in this context it implies to to them, or uh, uh, though it's strictly speaking means of them, it implies to them. Or it could be we could, if you want to add another word, we could say uh, in Tamil Bhagavan says um, in the in the uh, heart cave. So we could say in the heart cave of both souls who are fixed of themselves, having seen by a discerning intellect who is the one yoked with the eye condition, from where does he rise? Um, then he, in the final line, he says, um, Soham sporti teya arunachila shiva uh, pono vibhati swayam. Um, uh, Purnaha means the whole, the infinite whole. Uh, Arunachala Shiva. So Arunachala Shiva is the infinite whole. It means the same as the word that Bhagavan used in Tamil, which is actually also a Sanskrit word, Vibhu. Vibhu means the all, the, the omnipresent or the omnipresent Lord. Um, so Arunachala Shiva, the whole, shines spontaneously. Uh, um, how does he shine spontaneously? Um Saha Aham Sporti Teya as the as the as the um clarity he is I. Uh Sporti um wait a second. Uh, sorry, I'm because I'm not very good at Sanskrit. I made notes here in the in the word explanation. Uh, Sporti Teya, as the shining, shining forth, clarity, appearance, manifestation. Sporti means shining or shining forth, and Teya is the instrumental third case singular form of the suffix ta, which means the same as the English suffix ness. So Sporti Teya literally means with or by the shiningness, or, or in other words, the clearness or clarity. So sporti te teya means um, uh, by, the, by the clarity of a shining, uh, soham, he is I. So um, the meaning of the whole verse is the body is of the nature of insentience, like any, anything other, like anything composed of clay. There is no I concept belonging to it. Consequently, not I. Also because of the established continuity of the existence of oneself during sleep, in which it is non-existent. It, it means body. Um, to selves fixed as themselves, having seen by a discerning intellect who is the one yoked with the eye condition from where, the whole Arunachya Shiva shines spontaneously as the clarity he is I. Soham. Um, it, uh, the explanatory paraphrase that I, I wrote for this is, the body is jadatmakam, uh, of the nature of jada in sentience or non-awareness, like a pot or anything else composed of clay. There is no ahambuddhi, concept or awareness I, belonging to it. In other words, it does not have any awareness of itself as I. Consequently, it is not I. Also, because of the established or certain continuity of the existence of oneself at the time of or during sleep, in which it, in which it, namely the body, is non-existent. 
um, to solve fixtures themselves, um, to solve fixtures themselves in place, to those who are firm, if we were firmly being as they actually are, having seen by means of a keenly discerning intellect or pure mind, who is the one who is yoked with Ahambhava, the eye condition or state of being I, namely ego, and from where did it arise? The uh, uh, Purna, the one infinite whole, namely Aranraksha Shiva, shines spontaneously as Soham Sporty, the clarity he is I. Uh, thank you. Right. So, um, thank you, Michael. So, this... um, so why, uh, one thing was never clear to me is so the Bhagwan wrote this verse in, in Sanskrit first, and then on the same day he translated it into Tamil. Yeah. Um, so, where is um, Ganapati Muni coming into the picture? Why is he uh, changing this again? What what about Bhagwan wrote it in Sanskrit? Because he happened to be there at the time. Oh, is he and, like a proofreader or something? Was he playing the role of a proofreader? Well, what was he? Why was he changing? I don't get that. Um, Bhagavan is not an expert in Sanskrit. Bhagavan, uh, Bhagavan never actually studied Sanskrit. How Bhagavan was able to understand Sanskrit and um, and compose verses in Sanskrit, it is only because he's Bhagavan. But I mean, he had no formal training in Sanskrit at all. So whenever Bhagavan composed anything in Sanskrit, if Kaviganta was there or any other person who knew Sanskrit better than him, he would show it to them. And uh, Kaviganta took the license to um, thinking he could, uh, thinking a peta would be a more appropriate word than a barber, he changed it. Hmm. And so, Bhagavan is Bhagavan will not do if someone wants to change what Bhagavan has written, he'll just keep quiet. But later, it's, it's Suri Nagama has recorded in in letters from Sri uh, from Sri Ramanashram. Um and that is many years later. This was in the late 1940s, I think 1946 or so. Uh Bhagavan was one one day telling but uh, talking about the Tamil uh meter a uh, member and he was saying that uh uh though it's a um in tamil you're not considered to be a proper poet if you can't compose Bemba. it's a sort of it's the it's the benchmark of being a, a proper poet is the ability to compose vembas um but <clears throat> Bhagavan was, the story Bhagavan was telling was once kabyaganta was talking about the greatness of sanskrit prosody there are such beautiful poetic meters in Sanskrit. There's no poetry in the world but compares with Sanskrit poetry. And Bhagavan just uh, quietly observed, well, in Tamil, we also have many very beautiful uh, meters. Um, uh, but, and uh, Kabir Ganta was talking about various meters in Sanskrit. And Bhagavan pointed out similar meters are also there in Tamil, particularly um, what, what in Sanskrit are called Vrittams, in Tamil are called Viratam. It's and it, it very much follows a similar type, very, very similar prosody. Um, but then Bhagavan said, um, do you have anything like Vemba in Sanskrit? And then Bhagavan Kaviganta asked, well, but what is the rule of a Vemba? And then Bhagavan explained to him. And Kaviganta said, No, no, we don't have anything like that. And Bhagavan said, This is considered as the uh, this is the most basic. Uh, well, not the most, it's obviously not the most basic, it's not an easy meter, but if someone can't compose them, but they're not considered as a poet in Tamil, traditionally. So, um, Bhagavan said, well, if there's no such meter in Sanskrit, can you compose a verse in Sanskrit in this meter? And Kabir Ganta struggled and wasn't able to do so. So then Bhagavan said, then at least in Telugu, your mother tongue, you, can you compose? And Kabiraganta struggled and he couldn't do so. I think the reason Bhagavan did this was to, um, to subdue his pride, because he was talking very proudly about that, uh, because he's a great poet in Sanskrit. So by um, uh, he was very proud of what a great uh, 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 Sanskrit poetry, the meters they have, and he was very proud of that. So to subdue his pride, Bhagavan did this. So 
many years later, when Bhagavan was telling, Bhagavan sometimes used to tell this uh, story, when Bhagavan was telling this story, uh, um, Suri Nagama asked Bhagavan, well, if he couldn't compose uh, Vember in, in Telugu, Bhagavan, why don't you compose Vember in Telugu? And she's recorded in her letter that Bhagavan said, if I compose anything in Telugu, your people will uh, will uh, see it and say, no, no, this isn't right, this isn't right, and they'll start correcting it. So I prefer not to compose anything. But she, she went on pressing him, but he kept quiet. But then spontaneously he he wrote a verse in Telugu in Vemba, and he, then he wrote all the five verses. Um, but uh, why I mention that here, Bhagavan was aware, but people, when it, whenever he composed in um, in uh, Sanskrit or uh, Telugu or Malayalam, there were people who clay, who knew those languages better than him, who would say, oh, no, no, it's, this isn't right, that isn't right. That's why generally Bhagavan preferred just to compose in Tamil, because nobody can say um, the Bhagavan, I mean, Bhagavan is... Uh, among the very greatest of great Tamil poets. So um, nobody can um, can uh, find fault with Bhagavan's Tamil uh, poetry, but the people uh, did find fault with his poetry in uh, these other three languages. So, and Bhagavan is very, very humble. So if he composes anything, he'll show it to someone who knows the language better than him. And if they choose to correct it, he'll keep quiet. Even though he knew that coming, the reason there was nothing wrong with the Baba, it, it, but poetically, it's, it, it fits the meter perfectly well. So there's no, um, there's no reason, there's no um, poetic or linguistic reason for changing a Baba. The only reason for changing a Baba is, that, I mean, the only possible reason would be because he didn't like the meaning of it. Right. So just for record, a couple of things I want to mention. This incident that um, Michael's talked about is is mentioned in um, in Path of Sri Ramana, um, our 2023 edition in page 31. Uh, Swami discusses in detail about this incident. Yeah. Uh, and I'm looking at page 31. So if anyone wants to go read it, uh, I would actually strongly recommend you please read it. Most of you have a book um, to... Um, um, you know, uh, get a good idea of this this key point. And the second thing is, it also mentions that the verse is correctly printed as verse fifty six in Sri Ramana Hridayam um, of Ramana Hridayam in a booklet called Revelation. So I haven't seen that book, but it's a it yeah, printed yeah. verse fifty six correctly. But in a lot of other editions, it is not. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so. Uh, and I've uh, also actually there are some other versions. I don't know. It's um, there's in the um, part of the third line. This drishtatma uh, nishtatma nam. Some mm -hmm. people have put there siddhatma nam. The last last word of the third line in some printed versions. Where that come from, I don't know. But this the version I've given. I talked about today. That is the actual version as Bhagavan composed it. Right. I think sometimes people are careless in copying and then you get different versions. Like with right. many ancient texts, there are so, they, there is, when they compare different manuscripts, they find different versions because while copying, people, people make mistakes while copying. Sometimes they put one word instead of another word. So poetically, uh, Siddha would fit in place of uh, Nishta, but it wasn't actually there in the version composed by Bhagavan. So um, it's kind of surprising because the very reason scriptures are written by great ones in the worst form is to make sure people don't modify it. Yeah, and in spite of it, there are <laughs> occasional instances like this when <laughs> yeah, yeah, when people get in and modify it. Yeah. Um, well, I so think this that. The change from Nishta to Siddha in the third line is probably just carelessness in copying mm -hmm. and or in proofreading or whatever. But um, 
But the other I, one, I, wasn't there's no, there's, there's no that. reason why some, someone should deliberately change that. But uh, I think it's just carelessness. Right, but the other one was intentional. The other the one was way. intentional. Um, yes. Like uh, kind of a thing. Okay, so uh, the questions. Uh, the you mentioned that in sleep, um, uh, there is no such thing as 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 causal body, cognitive yeah. area, right? Um, and so I think the Vedantins probably introduced it to explain the continuity there. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, okay, so now so you took it away. So what then maintains the continuity? I. Uh, that is the, the one thing that is continuous mm -hmm. is our own existence. No so, other, nothing else is necessary to maintain that continuity. Right. But so um, before X goes to sleep, X is attached with the body, uh, you know, the, the body, right? Yeah, and then now there's deep sleep, and then comes back again. Then now X identifies with the, uh, with the body. The ego comes in. Identification mm -hmm. happens again. How is it so perfect? With the it's same the, body, it's the same ego. The same ego and the same vasana has come back. I mean, when ego comes back, it brings all its vasanas with it, and it projects everything the same as it was. Where but, was the but, ego but, during but, the but, sleep? But, but, but the problem, the, <clears throat> that is all this is very difficult to understand. If we believe that ego actually exists, that is right. the, the problem people have is, if ego is, doesn't exist in sleep, how does it, I mean, they may not always express it in this way, but what it, what it amounts to is they're saying, if ego doesn't exist in sleep, how does it come into existence in the waking or dream state? Because how can something be exist and then cease to exist and then come back into existence again? It doesn't seem to make any sense. That is difficult to understand if you think ego actually exists. But the whole point is ego doesn't actually exist. That is, people used to ask Bhagavan, or, I mean, people ask these questions in so many ways. Why, why did Maya create all this? How did Maya come into existence and everything? But all this amounts to saying, because Maya is nothing but ego, uh, how or why did ego come into existence? And but people often used to ask Bhagavan this question. He, Bhagavan had a very nice answer. He said, first you investigate and find this ego and bring the ego here, and then we can find out how it came into existence. Because if we, why Bhagavan, Bhagavan said that jokingly, but it has a very deep meaning. It's see, so long as we're looking outwards, we seem to be ego. But if we look within to look for this ego, no such thing is there to be found. Tedina lotum pidicum, it's thought it takes flight. So if you look for it, there's no such thing. We seem to be ego only when we're not looking at ourselves. If we look at ourselves, there's no such thing as ego to be found. Since ego doesn't exist, it's, it's, there's, um, why should we try to find out the reason that it exists? It's like asking, why was the son of a barrow woman born? How was he born? And that, those questions make no sense at all, because there's no such thing as the son of a barren woman. If a woman is barren, that means she has no children at all. If she, if she has a son, then she's not barren. So a, a, the son of a barren woman is like a square circle. It's a logical impossibility. So as, as non-existent as the son of a barren woman is ego. But ego seems to exist, so all these problems seem to be there. And because we... Since we cannot explain, since ego doesn't exist, that doesn't actually exist, we can never explain why or how it came into existence in the first place. Since we can't explain how or why it came into existence in the first place, why should we bother about trying to explain why or how it came into existence from sleep? Yeah. If We're missing the point if we ask these questions. The whole point is, the whole aim of Vedanta 
is to turn our attention back to ourself. That is the that is the the practical implication of the Mahavakyas. Tatvamasi. What does Tatvamasi imply? Stop looking for that outside. Imagine it's God up in the clouds or in heaven or some faraway place or um, some Brahman who's, uh, who's uh, can't be seen or whatever. You yourself are that. Could, so could you, you say want... that one more time, Michael? I, just uh -huh. because I think it's really subtle and important. What you said in terms of the difference between ego waking from sleep and ego rising they are identical yeah and i think what you're saying is you people really need to hear you say <laughs> emphasize it please well it's it's so key since ego seems to exist but if we investigate it we find that it doesn't exist it never actually existed in the first place so the ego maybe sort of it disappears, just like I'm disappearing. I don't know why I'm disappearing, but anyway. Um, so e e e e e this is a very good analogy for ego. When we look for it, it takes flight. So, um, so since ego doesn't actually exist, there's no way of explaining how it came into existence. So we can't explain how it came into existence in the first place. We can't explain how it came into existence in sleep, from sleep. Where does the fear of the snake arise from, is what you're saying? It arises from a, an imaginative projection that is non-existent. Yes, but in the case of the fear of the snake, there's someone who is afraid of the snake. But that is, the snake is something different. But in this case, ego, the, the whole ego is the whole problem. That is, that means we ourselves are the problem. We as ego are the problem. We as we actually are of the solution. Well, thank you, Michael. So, so I, I would just say something before that. Um, There was something else before Bruce. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm no, sorry. No, no, that's what, that's okay. That's okay. But I'm just trying to remember oh. what it was. I Stephen, was. Stephen here is saying Bruce did it again. <laughs> we can't blame Bruce. We're all doing it again and again and again. We continue to rise as ego again and again and again. And perpetuate... you can blame me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I, can't, like I can't now remember. I was yeah, yeah, about to say something. Let's go to the next question. Um, what, what, what was the question I was answering? Um, well, the, the question was uh, what maintains the continuity? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and uh, meaning the, uh, the ego coming back again perfectly the yeah. same. Yeah. Uh, with the same body and so forth. Um, I think it's basically, if you go back to the definition of ego, which is basically a chit jada granthi, which is a knot. That yeah, is both. Uh, the the, um, the only the, continuity is the chit element. Exactly, that's I am. Right. So the that the, the not forms during the waking and dream states. Yeah, it dissociates during deep sleep and then forms again. Yeah, you know, so then it becomes easier to understand. But, so but uh, it, it, even then we can't understand it because how can we understand? Can you understand how the son of a barren oh. woman is born? We we. Our very attempt to understand it shows we haven't understood the basic principle of Bhagavan teaching. But ego doesn't actually exist in the first place. It only seems to exist. Right. Because I, so the way I look at it, it's just something functional. There's really no existence for it. I mean, there is no, no but it but like the question I was posing, Kumar, mm -hmm. the, the 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 like math has a purpose but only in the context of duality do you see what i'm getting at You're talking about maths maths only has a purpose in the context of multiplicity right. or duality right do you see what i'm saying so right. 
just like maths, if ego is a point, a point is an imagine an imaginary thing, but it allows orientation in a field of space time, of you know infinite space time. The ego, ego as ego needs that orientation, so it rises with the body, identifying with jada to create this this uh, maya of orientation, space-time orientation. It's as simple as that. But okay. in reality, when when it's only one, there's only I, there is no need for orientation because there is only I. Do you see what I'm getting at? There's no need okay. for an imaginary... I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Michael respond to that. Yes, yes, there is only I. That is a simple thing. The whole problem is because we rise as ego... At the very nature of ego, but it rises and takes a uh, and projects a body and takes that body to be itself and therefore projects a whole world. The whole thing is um, it's all it's meaningless and it's non-existent ultimately. But so long as we're looking outwards, it all seems so very real. Yes, I am this body. I am sitting here. This world is around me. There are so many problems in this world. So much suffering, so much misery, so much joys and sorrows. And all this seems so real, so long as we rise as ego, because we take, when we rise as ego, we, we, we create all this and take ourselves to be a part of our own creation. So because we take us, this small part of our creation to be ourself, what is actually real is only ourself. If if this body is myself, then this body is real. If this body is real, everything else can't be unreal. The world must be as real as this body. So everything seems to be real only because of this, this uh, rising as ego and consequently taking the body to be I. So but that's, that's why Bhagavan emphasized the whole... I mean, what, what Bhagavan is repeatedly emphasizing in Uladunapadu that the whole problem is ego. Get rid of ego and all problems are solved. And what is ego? It's not it's just a false awareness of ourself. It's never ego is never has any reality. That that is there's a real element in ego, but ego as ego is unreal. So all we in order to free ourselves from the unreal all we need to do is to cling to what is real. What is real is only I am. Cling to I am, everything else drops off, and I am alone remains. As simple as that. Thank you, Michael. Um, so there is a question. Um, yeah, I'm just going to read it. I, I heard from an Advaita teacher that in sleep, the mind is still there, but without fluctuations. Um, it is not absent. Um, then I um, asked this devotee to identify the teacher who said that. And um, the response was Swami Prakasanandendra Saraswati. So do you have any comments on this? Right. Well, whoever says it, <laughs> that is very true. That is 90% or, or probably more than 90% of, of what is taken to be Advaita is actually a diluted form of Advaita because where people are not willing to accept, according to Bhagavan, the mind, the mind doesn't exist even in waking and dream. It only seems to exist. But does the mind seem to exist in sleep? No. Does anyone experience any mind? Do we experience a still mind in sleep? No. We don't experience anything in sleep except our own existence. So what reason do we have to suppose that the mind exists in a still form in sleep? Sleep is a state of mano leia. Leia means dissolution. The mind is completely dissolved. But yeah. only tempor temporarily. How to explain temporary dissolution? That's Maya. 
And Maya is, is it, nothing but ego. Is it the lack of strength of mind? Like like Bhagavan, like Bhagavan says. says, yes, it's a lack exactly. of strength of mind. Exactly, I yeah. think that's and, the key. That is, is the key to the rising of ego. Yeah, and what is the what lack is, of, of that strength? Yeah, and what is the strength required? The strength required is to hold holding it, on to the eye. Is to have the love to hold on to the eye. Yeah, and, yeah. and the willingness to surrender ourselves. If we're not willing to surrender ourselves, we'll try to impose some sort of. Um, some sort of reality on all this appearance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, and thank you, Bruce. Let, let me go on to the next question. Um, so, hello, Michael. Can you explain the experience experiencer dichotomy in terms of the nature of the true I? Is the self the real experiencer of everything? Does the self continue to be experiencer after the destruction of the ego? And then she goes on. So during self-inquiry, how can I avoid turning the self into an object that I'm looking at from the false eye? Is it that during self-inquiry, I should be aware of the false eye from the perspective of pure awareness? Um, to avoid objectifying the self, one important thing is to stop using the term the self, because the very term the self is objectifying ourself. When we talk about the something, we're making it into an object. It is not the self, it is our self. We are self, we're investigating. We're not investigating anything called the self. The self is, is a very unnatural term. In, when we speak, we don't say, the self is here, the self is talking. We say, I am here, I am talking, I am thinking, I am walking, I am whatever. It, it, why to use this term, the self? But the, in Sanskrit and Tamil, there are no definite articles. And um, so there's no equivalent of the word, the. And the, the term Atman in Sanskrit and the term Tan in Tamil simply means oneself. Or it, but it can refer to anything. It can refer to myself, yourself, himself, hers, <laughs> itself. It is, a, it is a generic pronoun. So the meaning of the word Atman is determined by the context. But people have got into this habit of talking about the Atman, the self, as if it were a, a, an object. When we talk about it as if it is an object, and when we are asked to investigate ourselves, we begin to look for some object called the Atman. Where is this Atman? I've never seen the Atman. How am I to find the Atman? Forget about the Atman. You know I. No, <laughs> investigate who am I, because there's no Atman other than I. So we, we need to be clear in our thinking. That's why Bhagavan has presented Advaita in a very clear and simple manner. So if we understand things clearly, that will help us a lot in practice, in, in having a clear practice. Um, you started by asking about the, the um, experiencer experienced dichotomy. The experience, the experiencer, our real nature, swarup, let's say Atma Swarupa, rather than the term. So Atma Swarupa means the real nature of ourself, in other words, ourself as we actually are. So Atma Swarupa is ekam eva advaitiam, one only without a second. So how can it be the experiencer of anything? Because if it were the experiencer of something, that would mean there's something other than it for it to experience. There's nothing other than it. And it, it is one without a second, so it can never experience itself as many things. So what experiences the manyness is just an appearance. That they, that they all Advaitins agree, multiplicity is an appearance. To whom is this appearance? It is only for us, only as ego, we experience a, um, a, a, the appearance of manyness. 
in sleep we don't rise as ego, consequently we don't experience any, any appearance of manyness. In waking and dream we rise as ego, consequently we experience the appearance of manyness. So the experiencer is only ego. Only when we rise as ego do all other things appear. That's why Bhagavan says in verse 26 of Ulu Naptu, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. Why? Because everything exists only in the view of ego. So without ego, there's no everything. Everything here means all phenomena, all objects. Everything that is experienced. So it's all the experiencer is only ego. So what is the relationship between ego and Atmosarupa? Atmasarupa is the fundamental awareness, I am, which is our very being. So that is such it. I am is such it. Ego, is a, as ego, we're always aware of ourselves as I am. But we're not aware of ourselves as just I am. We're aware of ourselves as I am this person, I am this body. In other words, we have upon, I am is our existence. I am this or that is an identity. So we have superimposed on our existence an identity. That identity is false. The only real identity is I am I. Because how can I be anything other than I? So even in this verse, Bhagavan uses the term soham. That is because there's a reason for it, because, of, uh, because he's explaining the meaning of deham, naham, koham, soham. But actually, the, the, uh, Bhagavan has made it clear the ultimate experience is not even soham, not even uh, I am Brahman. The ultimate experience is I am I, aham aham, nan nan. That is the ultimate experience. This unfortunately is lost in translation because so many people have translated aham aham or nan nan as I hyphen I, which is not what it means. It means I am I. The am is understood there, just like um, uh, uh, aham deham would mean uh, I am the body. The am is understood there. Nan, nani vudal, I am this body uh, in Tamil. So the am is understood. So aham aham or nan nan means I am I. That is a very, very significant because when Bhagavan says I am I, it means what is our real identity? Our real identity, we are identical with ourselves and with nothing other than ourselves. So, <coughs> <coughs> so ultimately, even uh, I am Brahman, it, it's necessary to be, but we are told, so long as we're looking for Brahman as something outside ourselves, it's necessary, we need to be told you are that. But we shouldn't be thinking, I am that. We should be thinking, oh, if I am that, then what am I? We should turn our attention back to ourselves. We should let go of that. And then we will realize what we actually are is only I and nothing other than I. So it, it, coming back to what I was saying, the pure I, I as just I am, is, is Atmasarupa or Brahman or Atman or whatever you want to say. That same I, when mixed and conflated with adjuncts, is what is called ego. Ego is neither the body nor the pure I am. It is a mixture, a, a conflation of the two. That is why it's called chit jada granti. Chit means such it, the pure awareness I am. Um, jada refers to the body. When these two become entangled and form a knot, that not is what is called ego. But e even okay, okay, everything, okay. to call it a not again, that's, that's a, a metaphor because it's not that the such it exists and, e and body exists. And when the two mix together, it becomes ego. No, because there's, obviously there's no body independent of ego. But when we rise as ego, we always project and conflate ourselves with a body. And it's only as a body, it's only as this action conflated awareness that we are aware of anything other than ourselves. So I've answered the first part of the question. I've answered the part about, um, I've, I've answered another part, but I think there's one more element of that question. Can you read it again? 
Yes. Or Sarah, I want to go ahead and, and, and post the, the last question. I see you're on now. And no, so then the last question is just about what do we remain aware of when we're doing self-inquiry? Um, is it that when, when we're doing self-inquiry, I need to be aware of the ego? Or do I just need to be you in a state be, in a state of I am, which is very difficult to do because well, we don't know what that is. You do know what it is. You you say we are always saying I. We the one thing we all know clearly is I am. We know our own existence. Do you have any doubt about your existence? No, no, no. That's not you know I am. Yeah. So what what more is there to know? When we are practicing self-investigation, our aim is to be aware of I and I alone, nothing other than I. That's why we focus our attention on ourself. We fix our mind in ourself. Okay. But we're still doing that using our mind, using the ego slash mind, right? Which is yes, okay. But, but as Bhagavan said, there's... There's just one awareness. When that awareness is turned outwards towards the world, it's called mind or ego. When mm -hmm. that awareness turns back on itself, it remains as it actually is, which is pure awareness. Okay. Um, if you guys don't mind, I'll just ask two quick questions oh, and Michael yeah. can answer them at the end because I know everybody's waiting for their questions. No, no, please. no. Please ask now. Um, and they're quick ones. Mm. Um, so... We know that Bhagawan was very fond of poetry. What yes. did he think of devotional music and dance? And especially music is very important to me because I was raised Muslim. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Kavalis are a big thing for us where it's it's a way of connecting in a very worldly sort of way because, you know, it, it creates a, a, a sense of excitement and emotion. But what did he think about devotional music and dance and specifically Bharatnatyam? Because I've been thinking about learning Bharatnatyam. Okay. Um, well, devotional music, Bhagavan himself composed songs, but uh, intended to be sung. Arunachal Stuti Panchakam, they're intended to be sung. And um, Bhagavan also wrote uh, Kirtanas, the uh, Apalapatu, the song of the Apalam, is a Kirtana. Um, um, and uh, Anma Vidya is a Kirtanam. Kirtanam in, in South India, Kirtanam is a particular form of, of song, but has a Pallavi, that's a refrain, uh, Anu Pallavi, a uh, post refrain, and uh, then some Charanangal, some verses. Um, so these are all designed to be sung. And but all poetry is can be, if it can't be sung, it can be recited. But actually, most poetry, you can either recite it or you can sing it. So, um, and, uh, yeah, so, so obviously devotional singing has, a, has a, Bhagavan approves of devotional singing. Otherwise, he wouldn't have composed devotional songs. In the later days of the ashram, um, they an, a radio was installed in Bhagavan's hall. It wasn't often played, but sometimes if there was some particular um, uh, devotional music was being, I mean, often they'd have um, uh, famous singers would be singing devotional songs, and they would sometimes be played in. in I mean, but, but radio would be with Bhagavan's uh, approval. The radio would be switched on, and the devotees would be there listening to the devotional songs. And Bhagavan often, when, when people were singing devotional songs or reciting devotional songs, Bhagavan was often moved to tears. Right. Because of the... the yeah. So they, there's no doubt Bhagavan definitely approved of, um, of devotional music. As far as dance is concerned, that's also a part of Indian culture. Dance was... Um, I mean, in the old days, the t in... in the temples of South India, probably North India also, they, they were um, the Devadasis, the professional temple dancers. 
they their profession was to um was to to dance for the lord so that's all it's all different ways of expressing devotion hmm. but okay. ultimately i mean these are all these are all good but as bhagavan made clear ultimately devotion is a that is the pinnacle of devotion is surrender and surrender means subsiding so all hmm. these uh, devotional songs and uh, dance and everything this can all be good for for um for uh kindling and keeping that fire of devotion alive but ultimately the devotion has to lead to our what is the greatest love to if you really love someone hmm. you don't think about what you can get from that person what you can give to that person and the greatest of all gifts is to give oneself so if we truly love god we should give ourselves to God. That means we should, giving ourselves to God means we should cease rising as ego, we should subside back into the heart. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is surrender. Uh, yeah. So Bhagavan's and, path is all about surrender. And the other quick question yes. is, uh, and I don't mean to offend anyone by asking this question. No, no. Not, no, no. means a lot to me. Um, did Bhagwan ever use the word Hindu or Hinduism? And the reason I'm asking that is because I, my understanding is to to pick up another identity would would just be more problematic in every sense of the way when you're trying to get rid of the twenty other identities that you've got. Did he ever use those two words specifically? Um, I've not. I've only. Only one thing comes to my mind that, that where Bhagavan uh, reportedly used the word Hindu. When, but whether this is true or not, I don't know. I heard from someone who said he was present at the time. When the news came of Mahatma Gandhi being assassinated, Bhagavan said what to do. He wounded the hearts of Hindus. That is what is said. Whether I I don't say whether that's true or not, but that yeah. is what I've heard. Um, uh, but Bhagavan was beyond all identity. The whole mm. aim of Bhagavan's teaching is for us to question our identity. So to to say I am Christian, I am Muslim, I am Hindu, I am Buddhist, all this is false. Mm. It's because we identify ourselves as a person and then we identify ourselves with a certain religion, a culture, um, a, a, a nationality, a race. All these differences arise only because of this ego, because of this false identification. I, I can tell one other story. This story I, I know is true. This I'm, I've got no doubt about. The first story I told you, I don't know. I was told by someone who claimed to have been present when Bhagavan said that, but I I wouldn't be able to to vouch for that. But the other story I can definitely vouch for because uh, it, it, this is very very typically Bhagavan. That is, there was a devotee of Bhagavan called David McKeever. He was a Scotsman, but he lived all his life in India. He was born in Mumbai, and. Um, in his young age, he uh, joined the Theosophical Society. Then he was a follower of Krishnamurti, so he joined the Order of the Star when Krishnamurti was supposed to be the next messiah. So later, he um, he came to Bhagavan. But he was always a person who was interested in dabbling in this and that. One, one day... Um, when he came to be, he, one, well, I heard, I, these were two stories. I, each one I've heard from someone who was present at the time. One day, one tall um, uh, Muslim entered the Bhagavan's hall. He had long robes. He looked dressed like a Sufi. He had a, a beard which had dyed in henna. And he came, he placed some, um, some dates in front of Bhagavan, and he, he prostrated. And um, people were wondering who this is. And when Bhagavan looked around and saw that people didn't recognize him and said, Bhagavan said, don't you see who this is? This is our Makiva. Because Bhagavan recognized him, other people didn't recognize him. Uh, so he, he had, at that time, he had become a Sufi. Some years later, 
he went away in the summer and spent the summer in Kashmir. And when he came back from Kashmir, he came dressed as an Orthodox Brahmin with a panchakacha uh, veshti. And uh, even I think he even had a sacred thread. I'm not sure. And he came and he prostrated to Bhagavan and said, Bhagavan, I become a Hindu. Bhagavan looked at him and said, who has become what? Yeah. So for Bhagavan, all these identities is meaningless. Yeah, that's that's. Who thank am you. I? I am I. Nothing yeah. other than I. Absolutely, and that's that's what I. And Bhagwan had devoted yeah. from all religious and cultural backgrounds. Some of Bhagwan's childhood friends were Muslims, and some of his closest devotees were Muslims. Many Christians came to Bhagwan. Sikhs, um, people of all religions came to Bhagwan. Hey, Michael, Bhagwan's mention the story. Is... Okay, Sorry, you're... mention. You go ahead, Kumar. Yeah, please, Sorry. please, please. No. So, um, I forgot. Bruce did it again. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, so what I was trying to say is, yes, but one's teaching is beyond, beyond all, all religions. Absolutely. Yeah, Thank you. Religions. Thank yeah, you that is, that's the point that uh, Michael is trying to drive at. Yeah. Because, Can... you know, but one is asking you to lose your identity as Sarah, then obviously the question of you identifying as a Muslim or a Hindu doesn't even come into play. I mean, uh, or any anything for that matter. I can tell another story, which as far as I'm aware is not printed in any book, but I heard this from people who were present at the time. At uh, one time there was a, um, there was a, um, in uh, Tiruvannamalai, there was a, a, a meeting of Islamic scholars, uh, some sort of symposium or something. So they, they met there for a few days in Tiruvannamalai. And when the meeting was over, they came to Bhagavan. And um, one of them asked Bhagavan, uh, um, uh, 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 Swami, what is the uh, goal of all religions? Bhagavan replied, Salam. And then he asked, and what is the means to that goal? What is the way to reach that goal? Bhagavan said, Islam. He expressed his own teachings in the lang in the in terms that they could understand. What does salam mean? Salam means peace. We all want peace. <laughs> and what is Islam? Islam means surrender. Bhagavan's teachings are all about surrender. Yeah. That's that's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I really needed that. Thank You're right. You. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, apologies to everyone else who's been waiting no, no, to no. have their questions. Sorry. 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 No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Uh, so, um, moving on to the next question, um, we have very few minutes left. Um, Ram uh, is asking, um, I'm sincerely trying to do a lot of self-attention. Um, <laughs> some days it's going okay, and some days not at all well and disappointing. So, do we just forcefully chug along? Uh, uh, Kumar, if you don't mind, uh, I'll add one more since it's Ram's question. He said, <laughs> "The the I also want to Michael get an explanation of uh, that Sachit Grandi for the I thought. Uh, if if you don't mind, one more time, if you can elaborate on that, just for my sake. Uh, oh, thank you. The I thought is what is otherwise called uh, uh, Chit Granti. These are all different descriptions of ego. Ego." The term Bhagavan used in Tamil is nanenum ninebu, the thought called I. Um, so that thought called I is the first thought, that is ego. So that's one description of ego to call it the thought called I or I thought. Another description of ego is to call it chit jada granti because it is a conflation of chit and jada. So these are just different descriptions of ego. But to help us to understand the nature of ego, ego is nothing but a thought. It's a thought because it's uh, the, the only thing that is not a thought is our own real nature. The body is a thought. Since the ego is a conflation of chit and jada, it, it, it itself is a thought. But unlike all other thoughts, it's the only in thought, thought, it's the only thought that is endowed with awareness. So it is the subject, all other thoughts are objects, but it is still a thought. Um, so, so Michael, Michael, one, sorry, one thing. Mm -hmm. So the uh, thought I, 
has access to the real eye and also it's connected to the body. So it, it is one special thought which is connected to our uh, awareness and uh, and uh, the real eye, I meant, and also the body. Is that what uh, it means by it, such a grant? It is a conflation. Conflation means one thing taken to be the other. We are now aware of ourselves as I am this body. So we are mistaking this body to be I. I is such it. Uh, this body is something jada. So we are, mi we, are, we are identifying two contrary things as one. So we are conflating them, mistaking one to be the other. So ego is nothing but that conflation. That which is conflated. Uh, okay, so so the the I thought is the one which has access to that awareness as well. It very reality is that awareness. That is, uh, yeah, the, what is actually exists, what is real is only the fundamental awareness I am. Ego is that fundamental awareness I am, mixed and conflated with adjuncts. So it, it is ever aware of itself as I am, but instead of it being aware of itself as just I am, it's aware of itself as I am this or I am that. So it's an adjunct conflated awareness. So the aim of self-investigation is for us to turn our attention away from jada, back towards chit, back towards this fundamental awareness I am. By holding on to this fundamental awareness I am, but when we hold on to the fundamental awareness I am, the adjuncts will drop off, because the adjuncts can't hold us. We are holding the adjuncts. It is I who says I am this body. This body doesn't say I, uh, I am the I, the body is, has no awareness I at all, as Bhagavan says in this verse we were talking about today. So it's we who hold on to the body and say, I am this body. So if instead of holding on to this body, if we hold on to ourselves, the body will drop off, all the adjuncts will drop off, and the pure I alone will remain. It's as simple as that. So it is a special thought. The I thought is a special thought compared to any other thought we may have. Yes, yes. Without the I thought, no other thought can exist. Because it, okay. all other thoughts exist only in the view of the I thought. Got it. Okay. And then I, I asked the trivial question about, you know, me getting disappointed when, you know, days don't go well. But I guess uh, we, we should stop uh, judging ourselves as well, since those are also thoughts, I suppose. All that is necessary is we, rather than feeling disappointed, oh, today didn't go so well, that every moment is precious. Rather than regretting that today I haven't been attending to myself enough, let us attend to ourselves here and now. Let, if we take care of each moment, we, we, don't, we don't have to worry about how many hours have I medi held on to I today. All we need to be concerned about, the only thing that is in our hands, is to hold on to ourselves now. Forget about the past and future. It's the present moment we need to hold on to ourselves. Got it. Okay. Thank you. And Kumar, you can... It is yeah, the, thank you. We need to understand the very nature of the mind is fickle. It's, it's, of, it's all, the mind is often always changeable. So we can't expect constancy so long as we rise as ego. The more we hold on to our being, the more we hold on to I am, the more ego subsides and the more we then remain in a state of constancy. But we don't come to a state of perfect constancy until this ego is annihilated. This is what Krishna says in the Gita, in chapter 6, verses, I think, 25 and 26. These two verses Bhagavan has translated into Tamil. Sane sane uparamet, slowly, uh, gradually, 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 gently, yeah. gently, slowly, slowly, we need to withdraw the mind and, and uh, uh, fix it on ourselves. I mean, he says, apma samsta mana kritva na kinchita bechenteyat. Fix the mind in yourself. Do not think of anything else. 
Then in the very next verse, he says, wherever, wherever the mind wanders, from there, from there, you need to bring it back and fix it in yourself again. This is just the nature of the practice. This is why Bhagavan said, what does it matter however many thoughts arise? As and when each thought arises, we need to vigilantly investigate to whom it has arisen. Investigating to whom it is arisen means turning our attention away from the thought back towards ourself, the one to whom it's arisen. So, it, but it's the nature of the mind to be fickle. We shouldn't be, if we, if we give up, oh, my, my mind's too fickle, I keep on going outwards, so no, no point in continuing. Nobody, we will never succeed if we, we, doesn't matter how many times we fail. If a small child is learning to walk, if it falls a couple of times, think, okay, I can't walk, I give up. No, but it's not the nature of a child, is it? But a child, however many times it falls, it will get up again. And sooner or later, it'll be, walking will become second nature to it. Likewise, we cannot be happy. Whatever we do cannot give us happiness. The only thing that can give us happiness is turning within and holding firmly to our own being and thereby subsiding back into the heart. This is the only means to happiness. So we, however many times we fail, we'll be driven to continue trying because we're not, we, the reason we, why have we come to this path? Because we're dissatisfied with, the, with this bodily existence. We, 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 for so many a cross of gemmas we've been uh, that is uh, uh, tens of millions of lives we've been looking for happiness outside ourselves and have been disappointed time and time and time again so now we've come to a point we've given up hope in finding happiness outside ourselves so we now uh, uh having been come to Bhagavan and being told that happiness, but we till now we've been looking for happiness in the wrong direction. We've been looking outside instead of inside. We're now looking inside. And because we all want to be happy, there's no, no one who doesn't want to be happy. So we, uh, once we come to this path, our very nature will, con will drive us to continue trying again and again and again. So it doesn't matter how many times we fail, we just keep on trying. Is that an adequate answer to your question? Yeah, I think so, Michael. Completely adequate answer. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so let's... Um, I mean, I, I want to just say one snippet. Uh, Michael, what you're giving me, I can't, I don't know how I can repay you because th this is significant. I mean, this kind of encouragement is what I'm looking for. This kind of, someone who has done a lot of sadhana telling me makes a significant difference. Thank you so much. It's all he, this is coming from Bhagavan, not from me. So all thanks to Bhagavan. <laughs> If you practice repeatedly, that's what Michael is expecting from you, Ram. That is, he, he, that's that's what the, Bhagavan that's the best is expecting gift you from all of us. You, Michael. Uh, I can definitely uh, assure that I'll give it to him. That's not a problem. Uh -huh. um, like Shohan um, asked the question, what is the difference? Um you know, earlier you said we are, we, um, the ego comes back when you know during the waking state, right? So he's, he's following up on that. What's the difference then from the waking up from deep sleep and being reborn to a new life? No difference. Well, the only difference is when we wake up from sleep every day, we come back to the same identity. But we wake up every day as the, as the days and years pass by, this, ident this, this body that we identify as I, that was once a small child happily running around playing games, is slowly becoming older and older and older. So sooner or later, this body is going to become defunct. So then this dream of the present life will come to an end. And a new dream will start. So we'll have a new identity, a nice little fresh little baby body. Ah! We'll be... Uh, crying and making uh, all sorts of fuss and everything. And we go through the same thing again and again and again. We, we grow up, we, 
this, we suffer all the pains of childhood and adolescence and uh, adulthood and old age, and we die again, and again we are born. This is, this is samsara. This is <laughs> the nature of things. So long as we continue looking outwards, if we want to put an end to this samsara, we need to look within and see what we actually are. And then we will see we never came and we never went. Pokum varavum, iladu, as Bhagavan says in Aksharam life. We are just that hoduveli, that common space which is devoid of coming and going. But in order to see ourselves as that, we need to, um, we need to, uh, submit ourselves to this warfare of grace by trying again and again to turn within. That's why Bhagavan prays in that verse. Show me the warfare of grace uh, in, the, uh, in the court, in the common uh, space that is devoid of coming and going. A common space that is devoid of coming and going is our own real nature. The warfare of grace is this warf this battle between our liking to turn within and our basan our bishay of basans that are constantly pulling us outwards. So in other words, a battle within our own will, between our liking to go outwards and our love to go back within. And that love to go back within is given only by grace. So who is fighting this battle? Ultimately, it is... It is grace that is fighting the battle, but it's fighting the battle through us, so we have to cooperate. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. Um, Malcolm asks, is the process of abstract reasoning the same as the rising of ego? The rising... <clears throat> no, all, all thinking whether abstract reasoning or thinking of any kind, the thinker of all thinking is ego. So without the rising of ego, there cannot be thinking of any kind, whether abstract or, or otherwise. So firstly, ego comes and then all, all everything else yes, comes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So the next question is Matt's. Um, is this is more common. Uh, he's saying the five-sheet body seems to be chit jada granti rather than just jada no the body is jada that's why i mean bhagavan says it in this verse he says uh, uh, the body is 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 jada like a pot um in um in verse 22 uh, of uh, upadesh undia he says all the five sheaths are in sentient why because they're all objects this body is an object known by us the prana, the life, the, the breathing, and all the other physiological functions, but uh, uh, the, the function, the, the life processes going on in the body, these are all objects known by us. The mind, in the sense of the, the thoughts, feelings, perceptions, memories, um, and uh, emotions, and all these, these are all objects known by us. The workings of the intellect are known by us. The, the vasanas that constitute the karana sarira or causal uh, uh, ananda maya kosha, these vasanas are all inclinations. They, we, they're known by us. They're all objects known by us. Do, uh, does a desire desire anything? No, it's we who desire. Does a thought think anything? No, it's we who think it. Does, so, does abstract reasoning reason itself? No, we think we are the ones who are reasoning abstractly. So ego is that which is ego is not any of the five sheaths. Ego is that which identifies itself with the five sheaths as I am this body composed of five sheaths. So so the, the body composed of five sheaths is the jada element of the chit jada granti. The chit jada granti is ego. So I want to explain where this question comes from. It comes from two places. And one of the places is verse uh, Uladu Narkodu 24, yes. where subtle body is one of the things that is called Chit Yada Granti. Oh, and, and, in that, in the, and that is part of the, the five sheet body no. or, or okay. corresponds to things. And so no. this is this is why why this uh, needs to be clarified. Okay, I'll clarify that. I'll clarify that for you. That is 
the reason Bhagavan uses the term subtle body there, and he also does again in um, in Uludu Napadu, uh, sorry, I mean in Nana, in the um, end of the fourth paragraph of Nana, he says, um, the mind alone is what is called uh, the uh, sukshma sarira and jiva. Here, mind, he's using mind in the sense of ego. We, we, the, this is potentially confusing, but, but there's a reason why Bhagavan says this. That is, it is often said, when, when, when uh, talking about rebirth, it is often said, but what dies is the gross body, and what transmigrates is the subtle body. So Bhagavan is there explaining the sense in which subtle body is used in that sense. In, when it is said the subtle body transmigrates, it means ego transmigrates. So one meaning of subtle body is ego. When the three of the five sheaves, that is Pranamaya Kosha, Manamaya Kosha, Vijnanamaya Kosha, are also called subtle body, but that subtle body, in a, that's a different sense of the same term. That is often the same terms are used in different sense in different contexts. Like take the term Atman, for example. Atman can refer to ourself as we actually are. It can also refer to ego, depending on the context. So in this context, when, when Bhagavan refers to ego as subtle body, he's not saying ego is these three of these five sheaves. Ego is not any of the five sheaves. So the same term is used in a different sense, in different contexts. So may I, may I point to one other complication? Yes. yes. So if, if, if you look at Uladunar for the four, five, and six, yes. in five, for example, it says that um, <clears throat> it is because of the five sheet body that the world is uh, appears or something like that. Yes. So then, it's, then it doesn't seem yada then. If, you, if, if the world appears to something, then that seems to no, be... No, he a... doesn't say the world appears to the body. He says, without a body, has anyone seen a world? Yeah. It's only when we rise as... He, in, in verse 4, he says, if oneself is a form, the world in God will be likewise. When he says, if oneself is a form, what he implies is, if we rise as ego and identify ourselves with this body, which is a form of five sheaths, the world will be accordingly. World and God will be accordingly. They will also seem to be forms. But it's not that the body knows the world. It is the ego alone that knows the world. Okay. Uh, but ego cannot rise without grasping a body as I, without projecting and grasping a body as I. And exactly. this is why it's a two-sided experience. Either you are not ego, or you are ego, in that sense. Do you, yeah, do you see what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no halfway between. But the truth is, we are always as we actually are. We are never ego, but we seem to be ego. And only when we seem to be ego... When we seem to be ego, we, we identify ourselves with a body consisting of five sheaths, and we consequently experience everything else. So, uh, Matt, have, have I adequately answered your question? Uh, I think there are more to be said, but I also think this meeting has gone on for a No, no, you've got, if you've got more, it's, if it, it's important to clarify these things, because otherwise these are, I mean... These are important questions you've asked because it's important to understand exactly what Bhagavan is saying and why he's saying what he's saying, the sense in which he's saying what he's saying, the implication of it. Yeah, so what, what I'm... There, there is also number six, for example, Ula de Napoli, number six, where it says, talks about the senses. And because the mind is, the, so to speak, the center of all the senses, so we can st stop talking about the senses and just speak about the mind. Yes. And that, that also, again, seems like... Um, there, mind know, is, <laughs> there he's using mind in the sense of ego. But he said, since the one mind knows the world through the five senses, 
the, that that is my the term mind is is used in many different senses. In verse eighteen of Upadesha India, he says, "Enangle manam thoughts alone are the mind." Of all thoughts, the the root is the first thought I. Therefore, uh, the mind is nothing but I. What he implies there is, though the term mind is used as a as a generic term referring to all thoughts, since the essence, since the root of all thoughts is this first thought I, what the mind essentially is is only I. So when the term mind is used, we need to understand whether the mind is the term mind is being used as the subject or as objects. The, the first thought I is the subject. All other thoughts are objects. So the manamaya kosha, a sheath composed of mind, that's referring to the grosser functions of the mind. Perceptions, memories, thoughts, feelings, emotions, and so on. They're all objects. So that the object they, they, they're, they're all other thoughts. But the Bhagavan often uses the term mind to refer to the first thought, I, which is what knows everything else. So we need to understand from a context the sense in which words are being used. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I, uh, I understand how you... Uh structure this uh, but to me all of these terms are a little bit more fluent including in this verse 10 in the Anubandam it seems to me that uh, it's not necessary to understand that as the five sees body when it says body there but see what he says in verse in verse um Verse 5 of Uludunapdu, the body is a form composed of five sheets therefore all five are included in the term body yeah, but you said yourself that words can be used differently in different concepts. Yes, and yes, all, but they, they, all, that, in Uludunapdu, word he, body. in Uludunapdu, he's giving a the reason he says that is for us to understand. But when the term body is used, because have, has anyone ever experienced himself as just one of the five sheaths? That has anyone Actually, ever yeah. experienced himself as a dead body? No, it's then, when, whenever we are aware of ourselves as I am this body, it's always a living body. So the, pra, the body and prana both are there. Has anyone ever experienced himself as a sleeping body? No. Whenever we experience ourselves as I am this body, the body seems to be awake. Even in dream, the, the body we experience as I seems to be awake. So, you know, in a body that seems to be awake, there's a mind, intellect and will functioning within it. So we always, when we experience ourselves as I am this body, we're experiencing all five sheaths as ourself. So when he says the body is not I, he means all the five are not I. If you're not satisfied, see verse 22 of, um, uh, of Upadesha India, in which he refers to the five sheaths, and he says, since the five sheaths are Jada and Asat, they are not I, which is Sat. Yes, I need to look at that again. I don't have it here now, yes, but yes. Uh, yeah, yes. I will take a look at that. Yes. So this this could be enough for now, and, and I will need to, I will look more into this. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. So, right. Yeah. In the interest of time, I think I will go to the last question. Um, going back to the verse, Michael, um, we, you mentioned this Purana, right? Yes. Um, so in relation to that, um uh, Krishna here is asking um so what remains you know after practice is just being um the Swarana awareness will shine uh what did you say and I wrote something that it's not no no what I'm saying is that uh, um go ahead yeah Hi, Michael. Uh, Hi. Thank you. Uh, regarding the self-inquiry, it is uh, when you say who is the one who is upset, who is the one who is angry, etc. You realize that there is nobody like that and it just appears the ego gets diluted. You look for the ego, it disappears. Yes. Now you're looking and there is nothing. There is a state of nothingness at the same no, time. They, uh, no, 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 no. That's complete misunderstanding. I see. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, uh, if, when you, I say... if you look at the rope carefully, sorry, if you look at the snake carefully, what do you see? Uh, uh, you oh, you, you see it's a rope. You see, uh, you see the rope, right? You've never right. seen nothing. Um, by nothing, yeah. I meant not, by nothing. I meant the person who appears to be. Let's say I'm angry. Yeah. And if I say, "What? Who's this I who's angry?" Yes. It comes out that I find out that there is no buddy I can really nothing phenomenal. identify or see or right. it, the ego disappears. As you said, "Teri na lotam pudikum." Yes. Uh, when you look for it, it disappears. Yes. Assuming that you're in a state when it is disappeared. You still are, but you're still looking. At the same time, there isn't anything that was the one which showed the phenomena of happiness or sadness. Yes. Now, when that when you're in a state when you have found nothingness, in that sense, I'm I'm saying nothingness. I'm not able yeah, to okay. find that find that state which was the reason why I caused experienced. happiness yeah. sadness something like when you see a a mirage and when you look for the mirage you identify that there was no water yeah so there when you see the reality that it was actually a, a imagination but not reality yeah so you come to a state when you realize the imagination and you you identify that that was an imagination and you stay in a state where you just are nothing yes. else now in that sense i meant nothing yeah but right. but uh, you are there and you mentioned in your earlier part that when the swarana or the awareness will shine eventually to clarify the 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 i or yes. the real i the the clarity as to right now as it stands it is just being uh but is it is that it or is there something beyond this that will further put light into this and further uh, clarify the matter or further give guidance as to where where do i go from here the, okay. the heart the heart That's thing that is the right. question okay um firstly about what you say about um anger and everything but um what actually exists is only such it the pure awareness pure being i am mm -hmm. ego is a superimposition upon that so we rise as ego and instead of being aware of ourselves as just i am we're aware of ourselves as i am this person all the emotions like anger happiness joy sorrow all different perceptions seeing hearing tasting touching all these are further superimpositions so the first superimposition is ego and ego the on top of ego then there are other superimpositions because as ego we're always identifying ourselves i am seeing this i am talking i am hearing i am i like this i dislike that i want this i don't want that i'm afraid of this so all these uh all these are it's the nature of ego to identify itself with this this and so many different things uh, constantly changing what we're identifying now i'm i'm uh, previously i was feeling happy now i'm sad all these it's ever changing because ego is a is is a it's a phantom it's it's ever grasping this that and the other so these are all superimpositions so when we turn our attention back within we are turning away from the anger back not even towards ego towards the reality of ego because ego is the adjunct conflated awareness superficially we can say investigate ego but if you actually begin to investigate ego what are you investigating only the as bhagavan says in maharshi's gospel in your investigation into the source of the aham vritti you take the essential chit aspect of ego so what we are investigating is not the jada aspect of ego it's the chit aspect in other words i am so we hold on to i am the more we hold on to i am the more ego subsides and the more we hold on to i am the more clearly i am shines so that clarity of shining of i am is what is called sparana 
So as soon as we turn our attention back towards ourselves, or rather to the extent to which we attend to ourselves, to that extent do we experience Sparana. But that Sparana is experienced in its fullness. Well, when it's experienced in its fullness, ego is thereby swallowed. Okay. Thank you. And then it's no longer Sparana, then it's Sahaja. Thanks. So even the clarity goes. No, no, not the clarity goes. The clarity remains. The newness, the, the specialness of the clarity. Uh, when Bhagavan talks about the subsidence of sparana, he doesn't mean the clarity subsides. It ceases to be something new or special. It, but it is I mean. recognized as sahaja. Novelty, the novelty, the novelty exactly. goes away. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, because there is no ego left anymore to yeah. even perceive that. It, it, it is recognized as Sahaja. Sahaja means it's natural. It's our very nature. We are ever that shiny eye. Good. The eye like that, that is always clearly shining, that is what we actually are. We overlook the clarity because we're looking outward. The more we look within, the more we, 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 we become aware of the clarity and the more we lose ourselves in that clarity until finally the clarity will swallow us entirely. Thank you, Michael. And uh, Titi, I, I asked your question, but did you still want to talk, ask Michael anything else? Just on the note there. You there? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I, I want to... Uh, something about that question. Uh, yeah, I, I recently I watched that uh, that video and uh, uh, the that teacher uh, uh, said that uh, he is he oh, how to say that uh, in a you in deep sleep. In deep in deep sleep is uh, is a state as uh, like uh, waking uh, or dream state, and uh, he use he give an example like uh, in samadhi you calm down calm down the mind, and the mind is calm down is uh, is blocked or is still, and um, is not destroyed. It it, it it is still there. It is the same is the same with. Um, with the uh, deep sleep. Um, this is all from the perspective of the mind in waking and dream. Oh, oh, that uh, one is... second, Michael. Uh, uh, because he was cutting in and out, could you reframe the question if you heard it? I think what he's saying in, in that video that Swami, whoever it was, was mm -hmm. saying that mind is just, the sleep is just another state of the mind, like a samadhi. It's just a state in which the mind has calmed down. Mm. What I'm saying is, it's only the mind, Bhagavan makes it clear, the mind exists only in waking and dream. Um, sleep is a state of manolaya, that is dissolution of mind. The mind doesn't exist in sleep. Kevala Nivikalpa Samadhi is also a state of light sleep. It's a state of manolaya, it's a dissolution of mind. So there's no mind either in sleep or in Nivikalpa Samadhi. Um, but let's leave samadhi aside for the time being because that's a, that's a, a state of manalaya which is brought about artificially by means of pranayama and other yoga techniques so we'll leave that aside for the time being that need not concern us it seems to us in the waking state or dream state but we have three states waking, dream and sleep so sleep seems from the perspective of waking or dream, from the perspective of ego in waking or dream, sleep seems to be a state. But in sleep, we don't feel sleep as a bit. We, in sleep, when we're sleeping, the, the state we're in doesn't seem to have a beginning or an end. It's only from the perspective of waking that we say, oh, I fell asleep and later I woke up. It seems to have a beginning and an end from the perspective of waking and dream. But sleep is actually, as Bhagavan made clear, sleep is our eternal state. Sleep is our real state. 
So it's only from the perspective of a mind that sleep seems to be a state of mind, but it's a state of absence of mind. But actually, sleep is the one real state. We don't recognize it as such because we're seeing it from the perspective of ego in waking dreams. So it seems to be one among three states. As one among three states, it's defective. So the, the only problem with sleep is we come out of it again. In other words, it's mano laya, it's not mano nasa. Our aim is mano nasa. But in the actual experience, there's no difference. That is, the, the mind is absent in sleep, it's equally absent in mano nasa. But in, in sleep, it will come back again because it's a state of layer. In mano nasa, it'll never come back again. So there is no mind at all in sleep because no ego is there. I mean, ego is the root of everything. Without ego, they, they, there's nothing. But many people, even though they may be very learned at ratings, many they may have studied all these texts, maybe they'll be much more learned than me. He'll be able to, I'm sure this Swami can quote all sorts of Upanishads and um, many verses of Bhagavad Gita and the Brahma Sutra and commentaries on them. I'm sure he's very, very learned. But just because we learn a lot doesn't mean we get clarity. Bhagavan has made these things very simple and very clear, so even dull-headed people like us can understand. <laughs> it may not be appreciated by the very intelligent people who studied all these uh, so many books, but we, as Bhagavan says in another verse in Anubandham, um, but uh, wait a second, I'll just get the verse. It's a very nice verse. Um, It's which number is it? It's towards the end of Anubandham. Thirty six. Um, rather than those who have not decide, subsided, though learned, those who are not learned are saved. They are saved from the grasping demon of pride. They are saved from the disease of many whirling thoughts. They are saved from running, seeking fame. No, but they are saved from not... Uh, what they are saved from is not one. So in other words, it's not just one thing they're saved from, they're saved from all these things. So being learned is not the way to salvation. We don't need to be very learned in order to investigate who am I. We need to understand the basic principles of Advaita as made clear by Bhagavan in his teachings. Having understood that, we then need to apply it in practice. Bhagavan also makes this very clear in... Um, in um, um in uh in the sixteenth paragraph of Nana uh what he says in the in the sixteenth paragraph of Nana he says since every text since in every text that implies a, a text of a Dwight Vedanta it is said that for attaining mukti it is necessary to make the mind cease after knowing that mano nigraha, the, the uh, subjugation or destruction of the mind, alone is the ultimate intention of such texts, there is no benefit to be gained by studying texts without limit. For making the mind cease, it is necessary for one to investigate oneself to see who one actually is. Uh, but instead of doing so, how can one investigate in texts? How can we know ourselves by looking in text, in other words? It is necessary to know oneself only by one's own eye of jnana. Uh, jnana means pure awareness. Does a person called Raman need a mirror to know himself as Raman? Oneself is within the uh, five sheaves, the panchakosha. 
whereas texts are outside them. Uh, therefore, investigating in texts in order to know oneself, whom it's necessary to investigate, uh, setting aside the five, all the five sheaths is useless. By investigating, one's, uh, investigating oneself who is in bondage, thereby knowing one's yatata swarupa, one's own actual nature, alone is liberation. The name Atma Vichara is only for always keeping the mind on Atma, whereas dhyana meditation is considering or thinking oneself to be Satchidananda Brahman. At, at one time, it will be necessary to forget all one has learned. So we sh Bhagavan's uh, advice to us is we shouldn't waste our time um, learning a lot. We need to learn what is the essence of Advaita, which is that we ourselves are that, and to know that, we must know ourselves. Therefore, we should turn within and investigate who am I. When we understand the basic principles, that's all that is required. So being learned is actually, according to Bhagavan, it's an obstacle in this path. It really is. Yes, uh, the, 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 no, I'm just you know, when you run in the center for so many of the folks who really struggle with it are the ones who put their hands on too many things and and refuse to let it go. Yeah. <laughs> Sadhuam often used to say, if you bring me a, a well-scribbled slate and ask me to write the beautiful name of Ramana on that slate, the first thing I have to do is to wipe the slate clean. Then only I can write the name Ramana. If I, if instead of wiping the slate clean, if I write the beautiful name Ramana over all the scribblings that are already on the slate, it will be lost among the scribblings. It will become another scribbling among the other scribblings. Likewise with the mind. First, we need to set aside all that we have learned till now and be ready to view Bhagavan's teachings with fresh eyes. We need to come with the, with the innocent mind of a child that knows nothing then only we can really understand what Bhagavan is talking about. If we are constantly um, trying to understand Bhagavan's teaching through the filter of all, our, all that we've learned till now, we will we'll just end up, we, instead of understanding his teachings clearly, we'll just, we'll just get more and more confused. So we, the first thing we need to do is to be willing to set aside all the, all that we have learned, and to see things with fresh eyes. Because the truth is so so simple. The whole, but, but according to Advaita, the truth is ekam eva advaitiam, one only without a second. What can be simpler than one? One is, 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 is the very definition of simplicity. If you've got two, you've got complexity. So um, the, 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 simpler, the, simple, the simpler our understanding, the closer we are to the truth. The more we've got lots and lots and lots of ideas in our mind, our minds are clouded with all these um, we may be very, very learned, but our minds are cloudy with all that we have learned. Thank you, Michael. <laughs>